Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert, Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. And my guest today is Patrick S. O'Donnell, an independent researcher and writer, or as he describes himself, uh, unaffiliated at the moment. Um, Patrick is a uh, astonishingly prolific and thoughtful commentator on legal scholarship blogs, who I actually first encountered as as a law student in 2002 when I started reading legal scholarship blogs and I've uh, followed his comments with interest for you know almost more than 15 more than 15 years now uh, and another th uh, among other things uh, he prepares bibliographies reflecting uh, a really remarkable erudition in a wide range of subjects, all of which I have found immensely helpful in my own scholarship. So uh, I'm especially excited to talk to, to Patrick today and learn more about his background and how he became to become such an interesting thinker. So welcome, Patrick. Oh, thank you. Thank um, you, Ryan. Yeah, so I was wondering if maybe uh, you could share with me and with my listeners uh, some of your own background, which uh, I know only a little bit about, but sounds um, remarkably unusual and interesting and uh, reminds me of some of the historical figures like Justice Douglas and whatnot that I'm most interested in. Well, um, okay, if I ramble on too much, uh, be sure to cut me off. So um, um, I was educated at a uh, private uh, Catholic school, and um, my parents sent us all to Catholic school, um, of all five of us, um, my brothers and one sister. And um, uh, they informed us after, after high school we were on our own because they had no more money to pay for us to go to college. So um, um, I wasn't that motivated to attend college after high school, so I kind of uh, uh, floated around different jobs, moved out of my house, uh, was extremely poor, and um, eventually I decided I need to um, go back to school, so I attended um, Pierce College in the, um, San Fernando Valley. Um, I think it's called uh, technically Los Angeles Pierce, Pierce College. And uh, I wasn't highly motivated, but I took uh, several courses in the evening while I was working and um, um, eventually decided to move to um, um, Isla Vista, um, uh, where the UC Santa Barbara campus is located, because I had a friend going to school up here, and I came, on, came to visit him one day. And the minute I got off the bus in downtown Santa Barbara, it, the thought popped into my mind, I'm going to move here. <laughs> uh, uh, which I did. I immediately uh, uh, went back home, tried to save up my money to um, pay a, a first and last on an apartment. And um, a couple friends from the Valley uh, wanted to come up uh, to Santa Barbara with me. One of them was going to go to school. Well, actually, ended, both of them ended up going to UC Santa Barbara. And I just came up here to live and uh, went to work as a dishwasher, a retirement home, had a, had a bunch of different jobs. Um, uh, one of which was in the uh, for the Forest Service on a, a trail crew and a fire crew, and where I met my wife, future wife, and um, and then when I got married, um, I went back to school uh, here in um, Santa Barbara at, at the City College and um, got enough units to transfer as a junior uh, to UC Santa Barbara, and uh, with loans, I um, was able to attend school and graduated. I think it was in 84. And um, uh, I was interested, I majored in religious studies, and then I uh, got a, I got an MA in religious st studies, but technically I did not. I left school early. Um, I was kind of an angry graduate student. I didn't feel I was getting enough financial support, and because I was on student loans, I needed a lot of help. And the apartments would help their graduate students, as they probably do elsewhere with, um, you know, um, teaching assistantships and things like that. And 
and scholarships, and um, I just didn't feel I was getting enough support. Part of the reason was uh, Ninian Smart, who I was working under most of the time, uh, was teaching half the uh, year in um, England, and so um, um, it was hard when you had the person you're working under not there to bat for you, and mm -hmm. so I kind of just dropped out of, I didn't kind of, I dropped out of school, uh, angry young man, I suppose you might say, and um, uh, went back into the working world, again, various jobs. Uh, I technically did not get my degree because um, the MA program was uh, part of the PhD program. So you would get the MA and then you'd apply for the PhD. But if you didn't get, if they didn't let you in the PhD program, they didn't give you an MA. Uh -huh. You only got the MA if you went on to get your PhD, which is very odd. Well, well I, uh, eventually I got a good job in construction. I became a carpenter. And one day I received a call, lo and behold, uh, an old teacher of mine said, Patrick, I know you dropped out of school and everything, but uh, the department decided to award um, terminal MA degrees and you have all the credits to do it. And why don't you just uh, pay for a, a tuition for uh, enroll for a quarter and we can award you your degree. So I did that. <laughs> and so I, so I mean, it was just totally out of the blue and it completely surprised me. And so I, received the MA degree, but I kept working in construction and uh, we had a big fire here in Santa Barbara called the Painted Cave Fire and one of my former teachers, um, Nandini Iyer, who um, uh, was in philosophy and religious studies and eventually uh, just religious studies and her husband was Raghavan Iyer, who is a um, political scientist, political theorist. They both taught the university and their, when their house burned down, um, she called me up to see who I was working for so they could get somebody to rebuild her home and eventually she hired the contractor I worked for and while I was working on her home one day she showed up at, uh, at the job size we called her former home while it was being built and said Patrick um, um, I'm going on a um, sabbatical well first she was going I think a little uh, vacation uh, for a time not the sabbatical the first time around and she asked me if I'd fill in for at the college and and that just blew me away. I, I was completely shocked. I, I thought, you know, I haven't talked to her in years. Well, why would she pick me out of all people? And, and I said, Nandini, are you sure you really want me to teach her? And I said, I'd love to. And uh, <laughs> so I did. And I was still uh, working in construction at the time. Mm -hmm. I filled in for her. And then she did it again, well, which she went on a sabbatical and she wanted me to take over a class. So I did. Well, and well, I was... What were, um, you, what were you teaching? Um, um, comparative world religions at that time mm -hmm. okay. at the at, at city college, and um, um, I was also um, um, by that point I went on my own uh, as a, a Finnish carpenter, and I tried to do both, but um, I got very frustrated because um, it's hard when you're working for clients and you say, "Well, I can't show up tomorrow because I'm teaching." <laughs> uh, which happened on occasion, and and then I talked to my wife about it, and I said I want to um, uh, quit uh, the construction, see if I can uh, teach, and maybe pick up some more classes. And and with her um, uh, approval, um, I did that. And um, but I didn't pick up a class right away. Eventually, I was teaching two classes, which still wasn't very much. But I was uh, starting to write and. Um, um, I forget how we actually made contact, but I made contact with um, Oliver Lehman, who's actually at the University of Kentucky in the philosophy department. Huh. And uh, he's a specialist in Judaic and Islamic studies. And we uh, started some correspondence. And again, I don't remember how it initially started, but but during the correspondence at one point, I had studied Islam, uh, one of the traditions I studied when I was at uh, UC Santa Barbara. I specialized mainly in Islam and um the uh, Indic or Indian philosophies um, uh, under Mrs. Iyer, especially in, in uh, Ninian Smart and Gerald Larson. But um, um, uh, so he asked me if I wanted to write some biographies for him for a, um, a biographical dictionary he was composing. And I said, sure. And I, I did it. And uh, those were published. And then some other publishing opportunities opened up after that. Uh, um, so I uh, ended up publishing a few things in Islamic studies. Um, oh, I also part-time, for a while I did some things for ABC Clio. I don't know if you've heard of them. They're a publisher in town here as well. Yeah, and yeah. Um, um, I wrote some biographies for them. But that was, um, I think that was even before I started um, 
teaching because I had a brother who worked there. And uh, so a little nepotism was involved. He get, got me some work and um, just so I could get a little extra money. It wasn't very much at all. But uh, <laughs> uh, so um, let's see what, what to say after that. Um, 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 let's see, I, I taught for, I think it was 15 years um, and, and eventually quit because I didn't get along with the chair of our department. Uh, very, very much. I tried to pick up other classes, and he would hire young uh, graduate students from the university mm. instead of uh, giving classes to me. So that kind of made me angry. <laughs> uh, uh, the theme of anger I see has arisen a couple of times here in my biography. But anyway, um, I, I just, uh, I, I guess, I always thought more of myself than other people did, which is, you know, probably not surprising. But uh, um, and we just had some clashes uh, over uh, course content. Um, the way I taught the critical thinking class, I thought was more in line with how a critical thinking class should be taught. They at the at our department, it was taught more or less like a formal logic class for dummies, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, they emphasized uh, deductive reasoning and formal logic, almost nothing on informal fallacies. Um, you know, any nothing about psychology with regard to reasoning, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And I thought that was a big mistake. So mm -hmm. I, I, you know, developed my own course and. And the minute they found out the material I was teaching, I was kind of called in and given a lecture and says, you know, basically told, this is not how you teach critical thinking. And I said, I'm sorry, but you are wrong. <laughs> and uh, uh, I had actually surveyed the material. I, I was spending a lot of time doing research. In fact, I spent almost an entire summer researching uh, the material for the class and putting it together. And what I discovered is, is they were indeed wrong. And even though it is true that critical thinking in a lot of philosophy departments, at least at one time, I don't know if it still is, was taught like a kind of simplified formal logic class, which just astonished me because I thought, you know, the, the subject matter is much wider. And, and critical thinking is often taught in English departments, which it was at our school. And there was a battle uh, over the course. The philosophy people in our department would tell the English people, you don't know how to teach it, you don't know what you're doing. But I actually thought that they probably were truer to the um, motivation behind uh, the course uh, than, than we were as a department. And, of course, that didn't help me get along with my colleagues there. So uh, <laughs> anyway, I basically just clashed. Uh, the, the woman, uh, Nandini Iyer, who... Um, who got me there? She uh, retired, and and uh, I felt kind of alone. Even though um, uh, one of the teachers that I had when I was an under an undergrad, or actually when I was at uh, the community college, Peter Angeles, who uh, has published several several dictionaries, one on um, Christian theology, one on philosophy. Um, uh, he he's really was a brilliant uh, person. He ended up um, coming back to a city college after teaching in Arizona and Canada for a while. And uh, we became good friends, but he eventually died of um, cancer. And um, while he was there, I felt at least I had somebody I could, you know, communicate with and um, uh, get support from. But once he uh, died, I felt kind of isolated in the department. I had more uh, friends, w w faculty member friends outside my department than in it. And I, and I felt they did things on occasion trying to just to force me to quit. They didn't want to try to fire me, but they wanted me to quit. And um, we had, I didn't have a very good contract uh, because we didn't have a union there. And um, um, when we did finally negotiate a better contract, it was about the time I actually left. So um, <laughs> uh, nothing really worked out in my favor as far as all those things go. But uh, uh, somebody told me I should come back to the school because now they've since have hired a new chair. Um, I've given it some thought, but um, I'm not sure I want to teach again. I, I was a little bit distressed over the, um, my students as well, who could uh, barely compose, you know, grammatically correct sentences and um, uh, did not want to read. I had no motivation whatsoever to read. Uh, the, the time I was there, the quality of the students entering the college uh, dropped, I think, precipitously, and I, I couldn't fathom why. Um, I had no one, you know, um, I, I, in fact, I spent a lot of my free time now trying to figure out what's happened in our society with regard to higher education, mm. uh, uh, because, uh, having that experience, 
I mean, and I don't blame the students. They, these were wonderful kids. I, it just somebody failed them. Our society failed them along the way somewhere. And um, they could not write papers. They couldn't do research. Um, um, and, and they just were not motivated to read um, uh, of any, anything of any uh, length, you know, um, le- a, a paper, let alone a book. And, and it was very distressing. I was uh, rather depressed about that. And, and uh, that probably contributed to my decision to leave uh, the school as well. So mm-hmm. when I made that decision, of course, again, I had to consult with my wife because she's the breadwinner now. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, the only other job I had uh, was uh, doing ground maintenance for our condo association. So um, 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 she okayed it, and um, uh, we took a big hit in our uh, household budget and income. And um, uh, but she said, as long as I keep reading, writing, researching, whatever, and I keep busy, uh, she'll support me. So <laughs> I'm very fortunate to have a spouse who <laughs> is willing to do such things. Indeed. Um, my, so I'd be on the streets probably if it wasn't for her, I think. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, Patrick, so how's that for a, a I love it. long-winded uh, I, summary? I love it, and I actually have so many questions more questions uh, after <laughs> after learning all of that, but um, okay. but given the nature of the podcast, um, maybe we can you, you could say a little bit about how you developed an interest in in legal scholarship and started reading oh. uh, law blogs and and commenting on them. Mm, that's 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 a tough one because I, I I don't know if I can pin down any one thing, but um, um. At some point, I um, uh, just started. I just saw a few law blogs online. Like I think, um, I think concurring opinions was one of the first ones. Are you are you yeah. familiar with them? Of course, yeah. I, yes, I, I, and, I've and then a couple um, times myself. Oh yeah, and then um, and then of course later I learned of the other ones like Prof's blog, um, legal Larry Solomon's legal theory blog. Mm-hmm. Um, somebody I've corresponded with and actually he, we met, uh, some years ago, he came out here and we had lunch together, huh. which was really nice. But, um, uh, and then, um, I, oh, I was also corresponding with other people in the law. Once I started reading the law blogs and asking questions and commenting, some of them would send me an email and ask me about something I said, or we would, uh, uh talk about these topics. And, and once that uh, started happening, uh, and, and having taken the two, um, a couple of classes, uh, night classes at the College of Law here, um, I, I guess that just all that together kind of uh, sparked my interest. And, and I uh, basically started acquiring law books in specific areas, international law, torts, contracts, mm-hmm. uh, constitutional law. And reading them and the scholarship, you know, uh, in those areas, uh, and of course, this my uh, book buying habits were dri- driving my wife nuts because um, <laughs> e- every time I would find a, a sub, you know, I would discover something new, and I'd say, "Oh, I don't know anything about X," and she would just shake her head and you know close her <laughs> eyes, like, "Oh no, that means another new area is going to go out," and and and, and essentially that's what I do. I, you know, sometimes I just. Uh, you know, I have the proverbial problem of being a jack of all trades and a master of none because once something starts interesting me, I pursue it as much as I can until I feel I reach some kind of dead end or, you know, uh, or something else sparks my interest. So mm-hmm. um, I, I don't feel any um, loyalty to any specific discipline or subject matter, uh, just whatever, you know, tickles my fancy. I, I like to explore and um, I find I it goes in phases. Sometimes I I'm really interested in certain legal problems, but then, um, as you may know, I got really interested in philosophy of mind topics for a while, and I still mm-hmm. am. And and I've come back to, in doing that, I've come back to um, my first passion that I had in college, which was the study of religious worldviews, and I've kind of rekindled that again. For a while, I got away from that. I was more reading in law and philosophy um, apart from religions, and now I'm, I guess, um trying to bring the two together a little bit more in my research and writing. So, um, but, uh, I think, that, um, oh, there are certain people too, who are pivotal. I should give them credit for, uh, being so kind to me when I would write to them or they would write to me and we would discuss matters and they would answer my questions. Um, uh, Frank Pasquale, you know, um, sure. Um, yeah. One of the nice, uh, he's one there. of them. And, um, 
And Dennis Patterson, who's at Rutgers, he does philosophy of law primarily. He's a big fan of Wittgenstein, and uh, he's much more conservative than I am, of course. <laughs> but but uh, um, uh, he really helped me out a lot. In fact, I wrote something on uh, Star Decisis, and he said he posted it up on his um, office door, huh. which which blew me away. I, I thought I, I that was probably one of my proudest moments. I thought here. I'm not a law professor, a law student, anything, and 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 he does me this honor, you know. Uh, that that piece I eventually published in an Australian uh, periodical, but I, I'm a little embarrassed about now because it's very, I don't know how you would say, uh, maybe doctrinal or introductory. It doesn't really uh, discuss uh, doctrine of precedent, say, with respect to how it's used in courts, uh, how they manipulated, say, or doesn't have a very uh, critical, realist, or um, empirical kind of approach. It's more just the doctrine and the theoretical kind of ideal uh, model. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I would never write something like that today, but <laughs> at the time, at the time, it sufficed. At least, you know, it, it gave me a feel for the subject. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, And then, uh, so Dennis Passon, Larry Solemn, I communicated with, and he uh, helped me a bit. Uh, and then um, the Legal Ethics Forum is another blog I was reading, continuing John Steele, and, and they, I would comment there, and several of the people, um, the late Monroe Friedman, do you, do you Sure, do you remember yeah, him? yeah, yeah. I, I actually began my career teaching as a visiting assistant professor at Hofstra. Oh, you're kidding me. Yes, he, he was remarkable. We had wonderful correspondence. He sent me books that he signed. Uh, for me, and um, I, I really miss him. He he was another. Per the only thing we disagreed on, we agreed on very much in terms of uh, um, law and um, um, approaches to prosecution and and, and defense, etc. But uh, um, we would uh, quarrel over the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. <laughs> I was far more to the left than he was, but but. But still, he re, you know, uh, we respected each other, and uh, we had very, you know, civil and indeed friendly conversations and arguments. And, and um, I really miss him. He was a remarkable person. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so uh, um, I, I hope I didn't leave anybody out. But they, these, these, all of these individuals, uh, they encouraged me basically without really ever having met me. Uh, mm -hmm. Steve Schifrin, of course, mm -hmm. at Cornell. Uh, who's affiliated with the Religious Left Law blog, uh, and then um, um, uh, Bob Hockett, Robert Hockett. Do you know him by any chance? Mm, you know I who he is. I do. He's at Cornell. He does mostly um, economics, things like that. But um, he, he, I uh, read a paper for him and commented on it, and um, um, that he did on international law, uh, reviewing a book on international law. And um, he was very helpful. He's the one who um, who um, asked me to blog at Religious Left Law when they first began. Uh -huh. Oh, and Jim Chen, of course, at Ratio Juris. Do you mm. know Jim? He's sure. at yeah. uh, Michigan yeah. State now. Yes, yes, I know Jim. Yeah, yeah he, um, he, he actually uh, was the first person to ask me. He, he kind of pulled me in, kicking and screaming into the blogosphere, as it were. He, <laughs> uh, I didn't. He said, "Patrick, you know, I've been reading your comments, and and I have a, uh, you know, that Juris Dynamics blog, which is kind of uh, moribund now, but uh, except for the one I'm um, blogging at, <laughs> he, um, he just, you know, asked me so kindly and and uh, was so flattering that I couldn't refuse, and and so." Yeah, I think it was in 2008 I started blogging uh, with uh, Ratio Juris and because of um, because of Jim. So um, so all the, these various people who are law profs have been very good to me, and 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 I always had a very different image of law professors and people in the law, and mm -hmm. and, and um, my experience wasn't what I had heard from other people. I mean, I've really had uh, come across some wonderful individuals. Uh, I don't know if it's just <laughs> uh, luck or you know uh, good good fortune whatever but really i have yeah. uh, very nice uh, and generous people especially considering the fact that i'm you know i'm not formally affiliated uh, with any institution and and uh you know neither a you know a legal scholar or a, a law student uh, of any sort so um 
accept it formally. Yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I think I've benefited immensely from that. It's just given me confidence, I guess, you might, um, that one probably wouldn't have if one uh, didn't have such contacts, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's really a heartening thing to hear about the the profession, frankly, mm-hmm. um, that that people have been so welcoming. And, and Well, you know, I, online you just seem to read about the dark side all the time, it seems mm-hmm. to me. Um, 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 you know, people criticize, you know, complaining about this, that, and the other thing. And I'm sure there's a lot of truth in that. It's just my experience, um, and it, which is, of course, not standard, it has been very different. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe you could say a little something about your brief career as a law student and how that informed your interest in the law. Oh, well, uh, um, I was attending night classes, which was not easy because I was riding my bike and it was at night and my wife was thinking I would get hit every evening when I, you know, uh, go back and forth to school. Mm-hmm. Where, um, where, where was this? It is downtown, uh, right downtown. Uh, it's a small little college. And actually, they have a pretty good uh, success rate. It's, uh, it's they have a campus in Ventura and one here in town. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's another law school. It goes by a different name here, but uh, this is a small one. And a lot of the local judges and everything um, actually got their degrees at this. Uh, so, like one of the, which school was it? One of the California. Called, I think it's called Santa Barbara College of Law. I, uh-huh. I may not have that act title completely accurate. Something like that. Right. Santa Barbara College of Law. And it's 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 actually, you know, in Ventura and Santa Barbara, mm-hmm. uh, two mm-hmm. campuses. And, so and um, it's one of those one unique of, kind of California accredited law schools. Uh, yes, I suppose, because, you know, they prepare you for the bar exam and everything as, mm-hmm. you know, just like any other traditional law school. The, um, the you know, the classes I took were very standard, I think, curricula. Um, we were learning uh, legal research and writing. I had a class on contracts, introductory class on contracts, a class on torts. I'm trying to think what else. I think I had four classes. I now I can't recall the fourth one, but but um, um, just getting the case books and learning how to read, you know, cases and and, and uh, horn books and everything. All of that I found so fascinating, and, and I, I love just learning the methodology uh, or, or methods. I should say. I think it's a more accurate description. Uh, you know, the methods, uh, how to approach, you know, the study of law and how to just do basic research. And, and I found that so immensely helpful. So when I did eventually uh, drop out or, or not continue, I should say, I, mm. I completed the semester and just didn't come back. But um, um, I didn't really have many regrets because I felt it just gave me a foundation uh, to do research. I uh, I felt like any area of law, if I was interested, I'd know where to begin, you know, mm-hmm. get the requisite case books and, and learn who are the, you know, top scholars in the field, et cetera, et cetera. So um, at least I, it served I, me well today, yeah, I think. I just find it fascinating that you, you know, attended a law school designed specifically for the purpose of teaching people to become practitioners and what you took away from it was how to be. <laughs> I know. And, and I, and, and I used to shock my fellow students when, when I said, I'm just here to learn. I don't, I don't give a damn about being a, <laughs> a lawyer or anything. They're like, look at me. Why would you do such a thing? <laughs> no, nobody could fathom that. I it really, I mean, uh, that just blew everybody away. I think when I would say that, but, but uh, to me, it just seemed, I don't know, natural. I, I didn't really didn't, I've just never been that ambitious, I suppose. I mm-hmm. just maybe that's part of it. I'm not in terms of you know a career or anything like that. And and uh, um, if there's yeah. such thing as knowledge for knowledge's sake, which I don't really technically believe in, but but I almost approach things that way, I suppose. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it seems like you've kind of set your own ambitions in a lot of ways. Y- yes, I, that's a nice way to put it. Yes, I <laughs> I never thought of that. That's, that's that's good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing that you, you mentioned in, in passing in our, in our correspondence was that you felt that your, you know, your history of, uh, you know, kind of your labor history as, as it were informed your scholarship mm-hmm. and your worldview. And I was wondering if you could, you could talk a little bit about that. Okay. Well, I was raised in a, I would say lower middle class family uh, you know, we, um, um, I was born in Illinois and we moved to Texas and, uh, uh my dad was working for IBM at the time. And that's of course when IBM was just taking off, you know, in the sixties and, 
and uh, they transferred. Well, he had a choice to to uh, get transferred either to um, New York. Um, now I'm forgetting. I think it was White Plains, New York, and, or to come out to the San Fernando Valley and, and uh, um, uh, commute downtown. And he chose. My parents eventually chose the San Fernando Valley, which I'm very grateful for. And I have to tell you just a quick little incident that happened. When we first moved out here, uh, out to California in 1969, uh, there was a rock concert that was literally like three blocks from our home at Devon, it's called Devonshire Downs. Mm. And everybody was there. Janis Joplin, Jimmy, I mean, everybody. <laughs> they had, I, I, and I found this out after the fact, of course. Mm -hmm. And I saw the poster and I was just taken aback because I'm like, oh my gosh, we were, uh, we moved to a place where there was a concert with all the greatest people in rock music, and I didn't even know about it. And the, and the reason I found out what was going on is, one, we could almost hear the music, you know, faintly. Mm -hmm. And secondly, we had all these hippies, like, sleeping across uh, the house we just <laughs> moved in, which was, my parents were like, what are these kids doing here, you know? And, and I guess the neighbors, somebody told them, oh, there's a rock concert. And so, the, you know, where we lived, which was Northridge, was not far from Cal State Northridge mm -hmm. in the valley. Um, and this uh, uh, fairgrounds where they had the concert, um, you know, these kids were sleeping there. So um, when that when that happened, I, I knew again. I was so happy we, that IBM moved moved my dad out to California. Uh, my parents, of course, changed. My dad grew his hair long, wore you know more <laughs> colorful clothing. He used to have a crew cut that he looked very conservative, and my it changed my parents. They mm -hmm. they. Uh, um, maybe not always for the better, but they, they definitely were affected by the move. So I was very grateful. But um, um, anyway, um, just watching my dad in his work life and the way he talked about it and everything, uh, I felt like I got a good taste of corporate culture, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and it really put me off. And, and um, I sometimes would think to myself, you know, dad, why don't you just quit? Or why don't, you know, uh, but he he soldiered on partially because you know he's raising a family with five kids and uh, my mom uh, did work occasionally but not always. Uh, sometimes she worked as a bookkeeper. She had various jobs on and off, but um, um, basically she raised us all five of us and and we were all in a row, so it was it was not easy. Mm -hmm. um, not more than a year and a half apart each of us, so uh, you can imagine what that was like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, but. Um, um, was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So um, I, I at some point I said to myself, I never want to work for a corporation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, I'm not sure how my politics got. My parents were Democrats, even though my father eventually voted for Nixon, which horrified my mother and probably mm -hmm. led to their breakup in some respect. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I was always uh, maybe, you know, I was brought up a kind of a Democrat or liberal. But for some reason, I just I guess my reading I, I was buying, you know, Marx at the at the bookstore and trying to get through uh, Capital by myself, which I wasn't very good at at the time. But um, I thought it was impressive to have Marx on my bookshelf, at least. So, uh, but but I definitely had leftist sympathy. I was moving more and more to the left, and and then I said to myself, you know, I just want to I want to have regular working class job to see what it's like to, you know, live the way a lot of people live and, um, and, and, uh, have a feel for, you might say how the other half lives as it were. And so those were the kind of jobs I basically got. I, um, you know, people would often ask me, Patrick, why don't you do X or why, you know, do this or that Or I said, I just don't want to have a career of any sort and I'm not interested in climbing up any ladders. As, and, um, uh, and I guess I had no, ambition at all, as I said, whatsoever in that regard. So <laughs> I, I just uh, floated from job to job, and some of them I enjoyed. Uh, the, I worked at a sign shop, which which it was just, um, it was wonderful because the the person I worked directly under, there was um, uh, a man and his wife. She was the secretary. He was the painter. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the guy I worked under did all the other, the silk screening, the priming, putting up signs and everything. I worked under him. Mm -hmm. And he became like a second father to me. And, and, um, I got a feel for what it means to work in a, you know, a shop with, where there's some craftsmanship going on as it were. And, um, uh, just learned a bit, a little bit about the trade of, you know, um, um, may, or 
I guess you'd call it trade making signs and uh, sign making and and I really enjoyed it. And, um, um, a friend from, in fact, uh, one of the kids I used to babysit, uh, he ended up be, uh, working there as well. Uh, he ended up being about uh, 50 pounds heavier than me and bigger than me. So we we used to love joking about how I used to babysit him. But huh. he um, ended up working alongside me, and we became good friends. And and um, um, uh, that job, uh, I don't know, something about just the experience there had a big impact on me. And um, uh, the only reason I quit is because I wanted to move to, uh, that was the last job I held before I moved to um, um, Isla Vista, Santa Barbara. And um, 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 even when I got up here, uh, you know, I, I was content being a dishwasher, more or less. Um, um, I worked at a retirement home as a dishwasher and a security guard. And then I, I worked at a kind of a, a surfer restaurant, as it were, that the, the owner and the chief cook were both surfers, and this this is a, only in Isla Vista would this happen. We, I'd be in there washing dishes. One of the guys would come in the back kitchen and say, surf's up, and they literally would shut down the restaurant and go surfing. Wow. I mean, uh, can you believe that? Uh, <laughs> needless to say, they didn't survive very long. <laughs> <laughs> Their priorities were, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it was incredible. It was a nice, it was, I think it was called Sun and Earth. Uh, it was the uh -huh. name of it. It was a very hippie-looking place, and uh -huh. it was actually good food, but uh, but these people, you know, were torn between surfing and, and the restaurant business, and and really, I think surfing won out in the end. But, um, but yeah, it was the funniest thing. I, I wasn't any big surfer or anything. I just worked there, but... Uh, <laughs> but uh, and then I had other jobs. I worked at a recycling center downtown as a truck driver and laborer. And and I actually I, I think part of it is I also liked doing physical labor. I felt it was honest. Mm. I, I never wanted a job where I felt like I was taking advantage of people or uh, somehow they were being exploited. And I thought, well, when you're working with your hands or doing labor, you know, it's hard to uh, hurt anybody or you know take advantage of them. And and I wasn't using you know them as a way to get to something higher as it were and um i, I remember gandhi said something about uh, bread labor uh, he thought it was you know important for people to do a little physical labor every day and and he of course he himself you know engaged in different kinds of bread labor as it were and um, um something he said about that resonated with me has ever since i learned about it i i think there's some truth to that i think a lot of people who um uh you know use their minds for a living as it were uh, would really benefit if they, you know, carved out some space or time for just literally some kind of physical labor, mm -hmm. working with their hands. Like you do that a lot. I'm, I've seen your, your craftsmanship and things you do. So I, I think, I think that's the ideal uh, situation. You, you have the best of both worlds. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my, I'm sure my carpentry skills are nothing compared to yours. Well, but. I've seen well, these are things I've seen pictures of. I think you do an excellent job. And anyway, I wasn't doing, I wasn't doing anything like furniture. I'm just basically, you know, houses, you know, hanging doors, cabinets, windows, that that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Baseboard, you know, baseboard moldings and all that. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I never really learned any fine, you know, uh, furniture making or anything like that. And, and I probably wouldn't even want to try it because. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, at least. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one thing that I've I've always found especially interesting is the way that you use bibliographies almost mm. as a form of scholarship. Um, oh. And you you talked about that to some degree already mm. already in terms of you know your approach to you know finding new areas that you're interested mm -hmm. in and, and kind of yeah that's how, that's actually how that started is when I was in graduate school. Um, I began doing this. I, I would go to a professor and say, um, I'm interested in X, like, uh, uh, especially in the religious studies department. Often I, in, when I was in religious studies, I was uh, uh, basically studying the um, uh, role of politics in religion, uh, generally speaking, uh, in Poland, um, especially uh, in the Greens in West Germany. I, I was studying that. And then in Islam, of course. And, um, um, often that I found myself needing to go outside the religious studies program and seeking out scholars, you know, in other departments. And once I started doing that, I realized, you know, the way I could get a handle on things is if I would uh, uh, find, you know, the subject I was interested in and then just try to figure out what is the 
best work on the topic, and I started assembling. In the first instance, I was doing this for myself. I started putting together lists for myself. And, of course, these were always um, things I would hope to uh, read. I didn't always get to read everything I wrote down, but, but at least it directed my research often. And um, so um, I, and then I started saving them. You know, first I would write them out by hand, then eventually I typed them up. By the way, when I was in college, I, I only used a typewriter. We didn't, I mean, some people had computers. I never had one. Mm. Um, when I look back and think, boy, if I had been in college when there was computers, I would have been much more productive. But <laughs> I had this old typewriter where, you know, I would be, you know, tearing up pages and trying to, you know, racing uh, using erasable typewriter paper and gumming up my typewriter and all oh, it was a, just a nightmare. But, <laughs> but, um, but I, uh, first I started um, uh, making them for myself. And then um, a couple of times I had fellow students, I made, uh, I, I became good friends with a couple of people in political science because I was taking a lot of political science courses. And in fact, one of them uh, is, teaches up here now is a good friend, Manu um, 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 uh, Eskandari Kajar. He's in the political science department at City College, and mm-hmm. um, and the other the other one, Wayne Gabardi, he's now uh, at the University, I think it's Idaho, uh, chair, I think, of the department of political science there. But they were they were good friends of mine, and sometimes they would ask me for you know something I had put together, uh, and that was the first time I actually started you know then doing lists for other people, as it were. I mean, I was mm-hmm. sharing them. All this began. I, I began composing things like this for myself, uh, always. Uh, but then eventually, people uh, I found that people were interested in them, so I, uh, that's when I started sharing them and then posting them eventually, of course, online. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought, well, maybe people might find these helpful. And um, and I'm always asked, you know, the proverbial question, you know, um, have you read everything on these lists? And I say, are you crazy? You know, <laughs> I mean, of course not. But <laughs> I've read often I've read a lot of what's on the list. Yeah. And the and uh, that's how I'm able to compose them because right. of the and um, and I am a um, I don't know how to best way to describe it, but I I am a voracious reader, <laughs> and that's part of my downfall because I, um, instead of writing, I I'm, I'm often reading. Uh-huh. Uh, I remember when I was in graduate school, one of the professors used to say, you know, we get two kinds of students: those who read and those who write. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you know exaggerating of course but yeah but uh it turned out i was probably one of those who liked to read and and wasn't writing so much i, I have to almost force myself to to write or when somebody um um asked me to write something then i'll do it you know say mm-hmm. patrick will you do x and i oh okay mm-hmm. and then i i have a deadline and i have to do it and i'll do it mm-hmm. but otherwise i'm not very motivated to write because i feel like anything i say somebody is is said better and and i i'm not as near as knowledgeable as somebody else so I just prefer learning, you know, the material and yeah, not so yeah. much running. Around. Well, wow. I know the feeling. Um, I I, <laughs> use, I use call for papers as a way to force myself to mm. have, you know, an obligation. Oh yeah, yeah, that's good. I think that's, something. Yeah, that's uh, and and I'll and I'll say actually, you know, my experience as yeah. as a professor has been that many of my students would benefit greatly i -hmm. think from a bit more reading and a bit less writing Mm -hmm. um you know um i think having a sense for the field and you know this sort of bibliographic understanding that that you provide i think is really helpful or critical Mm -hmm. frankly Mm -hmm. in producing scholarship that has any kind of substance. So I have yeah, to say, uh, uh, the, the, I, another motivation for putting these together is when I would talk to people and ask for sources or material, sometimes I found how, how they would have, they themselves, even though they had a pretense to expertise, mm-hmm. often had a very limited perspective on the topic or, or, or their area was hyper specialized. Yeah. And that used to irritate me to no end. I would think, you know, why aren't they reading X or Y or Y? why do they just ignore all this significant stuff that's here? And, yeah. and um, um, maybe I was compensating for that a bit as well, mm-hmm. because I was often astonished how people who uh, I thought, you know, were so brilliant often were, were, you know, uh, massively ignorant in certain areas where they mm-hmm. should have 
been a little more knowledgeable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's so true. I find it really kind of weirdly ironic when I hear people refer to um, interdisciplinary scholarship, and I, I can't mm -hmm. even think. Isn't that just called scholarship? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well. Well. Uh, uh, and there's an anxiety about doing an interdisciplinary scholarship, and and and. and and truly, it is difficult. It's not easy. I understand mm -hmm. that. I mean, often people, you know, uh, of course, this happens when uh, philosophy professors have been asked to, you know, teach, you know, outside Western uh, philosophy, uh, teach, you know, material from um, uh, Chinese or Indian traditions. They'll often complain, say, you know, we have enough to do within Western philosophy. You know, uh, how can we, uh, you know, teach that? And or I haven't learned Sanskrit or whatever language. And but of course, Today, there's so, so much material available in English. You, anyone could teach who's a philosophy instructor could teach in other traditions, mm -hmm. at least at the you know undergraduate level for sure, maybe even at the graduate level without mastering the um, foreign languages. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, if one was going to be a specialist, and, and that's a little different, but but um, 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 they'll often you know complain. But I think you know really, if you want to teach philosophy, you have to be acquainted. You can't just have a Western, you know, perspective on it. You have to have some knowledge of what they've been teaching around the rest of the planet, mm -hmm. and and it's amazing how many, uh, how provincial and um, uh, very limited a lot of uh, Western academic philosophy is. Mm -hmm. Professional philosophy, it's very distressing. And um, uh, Ninian Smart, who was my mentor and friend, and I mean, for the um, uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy that was published. Um, I'm forgetting the, um, the editor, um, Paul Edwards, I think it was, back in 19, I think it was 67. It was in the 60s. Ninian was asked to do entries on Indian philosophy, which was pretty much unheard of at the time. And, and, and um, they were very good. If you go back and look at the, uh, it's I think four or five volumes. Uh, um, uh, if you go back and look at his entries, um, very good, good stuff. But he was he was complaining, you know, saying, you know, philosophers need to, you know, back 20, 30 years ago, and very little has changed. Uh, I used to think, though, by the time I'm, you know, the age I am now, you know, it'll be commonplace to be teaching Indian philosophy, Chinese philosophy, in, in philosophy departments. But still, it's, it's mm -hmm. virtually, you know, non-existent. I mean, comparatively speaking, it's. I just find it so incredible. I mean, it shows something about the arrogance and and. Um, um, Insularity. Others, well, there's lots of problems yeah. with it, but um, yeah. Well, one uh, could say one could say the same the same about law schools, in which mm, yes, we, yes, we, yeah. we we teach our students little or nothing about the mm. legal systems of other countries. And frankly, about, yeah. And well, you know, that's know why I like the the the, um, the legal. You're familiar with the legal history blog, of course, oh, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's one thing I like about that blog is they finally they've gotten some bloggers who know a little bit about um, law in other countries and they're starting to you know provide links to pages um, um, uh, Mitra I think is the woman who does the like uh, Islamic law in Southeast Asia etc and and she has a wonderful site herself that she maintains which has you know comparative law material and I did one bibliography on comparative law but it's now outdated because at least now there is much more interest in that kind of thing. I think it's really taking off. It seems to me. I don't know what it's like in the law schools, but um, but uh, if the legal history blog is any indication, there's much more interest. I think yeah, finally. I, uh, I, I, I I would not take the legal history blog as as, uh, as representative. representative. <laughs> of, of <what laughs> okay. Well, in the it's law a shame because you know the, it really it's fascinating topic. Of course, you know. Uh, you know, Indian law, Islamic law. Um, one of the few uh, areas I do know something about Islamic law, just mm -hmm. because I had studied Islam. But, um, but um, yeah, it's it's such a shame, uh, especially when if you think about it. I mean, how um, um, in some ways that's still a very kind of a neo-colonialist or kind of imperialist project. Then, insofar as we impose our legal systems on other people, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean we're we're really doing that at present in many respects. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like uh, this is something I wanted to talk to you about with, about sometime um, yeah. with regard to, um, you know, copyright and intellectual law and things like that, because mm -hmm. that, that's an area that fascinates me, how that's treated in other countries and how essentially I would say our legal regime, as it were, 
mm-hmm. gets imposed on these countries, and often it doesn't fit well with their own conceptions of how things are, yeah. you know, how people take credit for things or how how they're understood, you know. Um, yeah. Um, I, anyway, I, 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 could, a, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. Day. And actually, yeah, I've been working on that to some respect, in some respect, with respect to kind of Irish medieval thinking. But ironically, actually, I think copyright is one of the areas where, in some respects, the United States has kind of been colonized by Europe, as it were. Oh, I, so, I never even thought of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, 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 have to, we'll have to discuss that in, <laughs> in the future. Um, but, but so, Patrick, I, I think I need yes. to, to wrap up the, sure. the interview sure. now. Um, sure. But I, I really enjoyed talking to you. And, I, you know, I, I can't help but think of your your project as a kind of like peripatetic scholarship or philosophy of of labor. And I was just wondering if you had any sort of final thoughts or observations to leave my listeners with. Oh my goodness, uh, hmm, that's a hard one. You kind of caught me off guard. I would have to kind of think about that more than no. I don't think I could say anything off the cuff. Really, that might benefit them. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I would want to give some thought to a, a question like that before I <laughs> to, to, to answer it. I don't. Uh, oh, I love it, actually. I mean, that's actually sort of encapsulates <laughs> so much about who you are and <laughs> and what you do. So well, uh, uh, I enjoyed talking with you. I'm sure I've just rambled because right before um, we we got together, I had a cup of coffee. So that's always dangerous. So. Um, <laughs> So oh, I'm going to no, blame no. the caffeine if I no. rambled on too long. So. Not, not at all. It was a great pleasure, and uh, I look okay. forward to talking to you again soon. Okay. Well, well, thanks so much, Brian. I enjoyed it too.